Ani Bujo, Gwe, Tanze, Sheko, Halu, Bonjour, greetings. Miari Uesitu Tanya Chung Tiemfuk. Good day. I'm Tanya Chung Tiemfuk. I'm the Director of Research Programs and Academic Partnerships at the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Technology, or CIAT. A very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us for our Young Innovators panel, the first convening in the Indigenous Innovation Spotlight Series led by CIT, co-hosted by the Coalition of Innovation Leaders Against Racism and sponsored by TD Equity and Innovation Program. A reminder to everyone on our uh, panel to please uh, mute your mic whenever you're not speaking. So I'd like to warmly introduce Elder Shelley Mandakwe Charles, who has generously provided her wisdom, guidance, and support to CIT over the years. Elder Shelley. Uh, bonjour, we wene bonjour. Uh, Mandakwe Indishnikas, Maskenoje Gigon, Indodem, Joniang Minising, Minwa, Wawa Segeming, Indondriba. With those first words uh, <clears throat> that were sent up, I said, We went a bojo, which is hello. Sometimes you'll hear bojo. It's a short form of when a bojo. And that, of course, is uh, referring uh, to the one that named all of the plants and the grasses and the trees uh, and the animals uh, on the earth. Uh, those ones that are Wibemosea Oma Oma Akin Oma Akin Bemijuan. I also uh, acknowledge the four directions in all those different places that we come from, in all those different places that we have grown from, that we have laid our tracks and begun our trail on our journey through life and also in the in the calling up of the four directions uh, that we acknowledge um, all of those gifts that we bring from wherever it is that we come from uh, on turtle on turtle island and of course we also in those first words there uh, we acknowledge our our, our relatives, our ancestors, uh, those ones that we refer to as Mishomisananik, Gokumisananik, Ambe Majata, come over here uh, and look this way at this very exciting uh, work that we're doing, but also uh, where we are today, where we're standing, Nangum Gijigak, on this day. This day and this moon time, I'm a nomina Gizes, and we put all of that together. And in the doing of that, um, we uh, honor creation, we honor the very breath of life uh, itself, and we honor we honor each other. And in that way, um, we are uh, activating. We're activating indigenous knowledge. We're activating teachings. We're also activating the, uh, the, the teachings that we received from our ancestors, from our grandparents, from our parents, and those teachings that we may not have heard, but we are hearing them at a different level. Maybe we're feeling them um, on the physical level, on the mental uh, level, the emotional level. We may be feeling that in our heart, and we also may be feeling that um, in our spirit. And we know that when we're smiling, uh, when we hear teachings, we are experiencing that on a very spiritual level. And that's, um, we call that mishkike. I mean, each one of us has the ability to make our medicine. Mishkike, I mean, we make the medicine. And when we're learning more and we're sharing more, and we're observing and putting all of that together. We're putting all that together in the best way that we know and we honor 
we talk about and we hold it up and 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 we move that into the future which is the philosophy of mino bamad is it win so all of that goes into the opening and all of that was in the thoughts of uh, of this work this very important work today that you're embarking on that we're embarking on together and finally i'll uh, share this uh, one uh, song that was shared with us by um, a family and the one that lifted that song up uh, his name was gijiana quet and gijiana quet was from the west and it's a song that talks about it talks about this time that we are in and uh, that we want to continue to hear, we want to continue to see, we want to continue to experience life in the very best way. And part of uh, doing that is we lift up those good things uh, about Indigenous knowledge. We lift up as much as we can even even the smallest little bit of tobacco to the biggest sound uh, and, and song, we try to move that forward and put that into our heart to do, uh, to lift up that teaching of Mishkeki Min, you are the medicine. <clears throat> Go, uh, Gachi Miigwech, Ajoin Emission, Ajoin Emission. Oh, Chi Miigwech, thank you, um, Elder Shelley. That was really beautiful. And thank you for helping us start our circle, our event today in, in a really beautiful way. Um, so, Innovation and the development of valuable, enduring technologies that link ideas, multifaceted relationships between people and their natural and social environments, and real world applications are part of the DNA of our Indigenous societies. Indigenous peoples are developing and leading some of the most exciting and sustainable innovations across different spheres, such as technology, health, housing, food systems, energy, land and water stewardship, education, language, and culture. Indigenous innovation excellence, as well as social impact entrepreneurship, is growing steadily across sectors and professional disciplines. Talented young creators, designers, technologists, entrepreneurs, architects, engineers, scientists, scholars, and educators from across the innovation spectrum are particularly advancing bold, scalable, and sustainable initiatives and business ventures and are becoming strong and recognized leaders in Canada's innovation economy. Even during these times of pandemic and mounting climate and economic crisis, young in Indigenous innovators and entrepreneurs have been finding the inspiration and courage to adapt and step up to be leaders of their generation, developing exciting and viable approaches to vision new futures and tackle the complex environmental, climate, health and socioeconomic challenges that are facing our world. Our panelists today are transforming their communities to be self-sustaining and to lead in clean energy, green infrastructure, architectural and creative design, digital and data systems, futurity and gaming, fisheries and marine stewardship, governance and health, anchoring their innovations and businesses in indigenous worldviews, technologies and design principles. 
as part of our work to build strong and sustainable learning and skills development, employment, research, and leadership pathways for young Indigenous innovators and entrepreneurs to improve social outcomes and economic and infrastructural development for Indigenous peoples in Canada. The Centre for Indigenous Innovation and Technology, CIAT, aims to develop and enable the journeys, initiatives and leadership of our young and emerging innovators and tech entrepreneurs across the country. We're working with our ecosystem of Indigenous industry and academic partners through the Collaborative Innovation Network and soon to be launched um, Centre of Indigenous Excellence to deliver culturally relevant and industry-driven skills development, training to employment, entrepreneurship and research programs to advance Indigenous excellence and leadership in Canada's growing innovation economy. Some of our core programs at CIT include the Tech Skills Accelerator Program that consists of both a five-week boot camp and a 12-week fellowship program the boot camp provides an introductory training environment for new learners to explore and define pathways of their own choosing with industry instructors and mentors, including further skills, entrepreneurship training, or research and development of innovation concepts and initiatives. The fellowship program provides learners with a more intensive digital technology learning and training pathway across a suite of Indigenous focused but also industry focused course modules and is coupled with unique on the job learning experience. And finally, our Indigi Ventures program is a six week entrepreneurship boot camp, uh, which also consists of investment readiness mentorship and focused on early stage social impact entrepreneurs and startups uh, through inclusive and also indigenous centric investment models and opportunities. Our intention with the Indigenous Innovation Spotlight Series is to bring together and spotlight emerging and established innovators and entrepreneurs from across indigenous cultures, geographic regions and sectors who are using their bold ideas and initiatives to drive transformational change, both in Indigenous communities and the growing innovation economy. Our moderator and panelists are young emergent leaders in their communities and the innovation sphere. They are championing Inuit culture and identity, decolonizing systems, Arctic youth leadership, and innovative culturally sensitive treatment and healing pathways for intergenerational trauma and addictions recovery, advancing indigenous futurism and storytelling in digital spaces and designing game mechanics and narrative. They are trailblazing and mentoring indigenous young professionals considering a career in the tech industry, designing Inuit informed infrastructure and architecture for local and municipal projects, and leading health reconciliation initiatives across marine and fisheries, climate action, economic development, language revitalization, housing, and self-governance. I want to extend immense gratitude also to our CIT fam, uh, Daniel Rodan, our um, summer program coordinator who provided invaluable project management coordination for this event. Ro Thomas, our executive director at CIT, and Jennifer Basso, our director of growth and strategic partnerships, um, both of them for their leadership support. And then finally, our CIT co-founder, Jarrett Lehman, for entrusting us with and manifesting, um, or sorry, entrusting with us with manifesting his vision for CIT. Uh, CIT was co-founded by Paul Dubé and Jarrett Lehman, and I would like to uh, briefly introduce Jarrett Lehman to say a few words about the importance of this launch event for CIT. Jarrett? Bonjour, Anine, everyone. Bonjour, Anine. Jarrett and Dishnikas. Mangadawan, First Nation in Nongeva. Kidmandin Dodam. I am a member of Mangadawan First Nation, which is located in the Perry Sound, Muskoka region, I guess. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, uh, I just had a vision for for um, an innovative network and 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 
really seeing where things could go. And so uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, you can see more there in, in, the, in the writing. And thank you, Tanya, uh, so much for uh, the introduction and, and Elder Shelley for all of the amazing uh, opening and getting us started in, in, in the right way. So um, today I just wanted to share a couple of words with you on um, where CIT came from and, 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 and how that journey happened. Um, I uh, have an undergrad degree in business and I worked and did some graduate work uh, in my, my master's in policy and, um, and at, at Queen's University and I studied uh, industrial relations. And, and so um, I really, really liked my educational journey and I participated a lot in student politics um, uh, at the provincial or institutional level. Um, and so I was highly engaged as a learner in the university system. And um, I had a career through a bunch of several different organizations where I really got to learn some great experiences um, working with, you know, the Aboriginal Professional Association or the Indigenous Professional Association now. Um, and uh, for example, um, the Council of Ontario Universities, um, I was able to work there. And I really got to do some, learn some really great skills um, that really helped me in, in, in bring my vision uh, out. Uh, and, and, and so uh, in 2017, I um, decided that I was going to change sectors and work somewhere else, <laughs> do something different. Um, and I, it was spurred on by a program that I was able to participate in um, called the Governor General's Program, and that's with the Governor General of Canada. And uh, it was an amazing experience, um, and there was a lot of great investment from the Canadian government, as well as the Indigenous communities and, 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 and non-Indigenous communities we visited along our journey. Um, and I was inspired by, by, by that trip. Um, and and uh, I had already envisioned at that time that I was going to be changing sectors and, and seeing where the next big thing was. And I knew that it was tech and innovation. Um, I could see that it wasn't around my community. I could see the lack of, of, how, of, of, of productivity in regards to um, you know, me just sending emails quickly um, at the time, you know, some people didn't have internet, so it was hard. And, and, and so I really felt that that was where I, I wanted our communities to grow and where I could be of, of, of help or support. Um, and so I, I, I went on the trip and I was stationed in the Northwest Territories. Um, and I got to go up to Tuk 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 and right up into the Arctic Ocean um, and meet um, our, uh, some of our Inuit uh, uh, fellows uh, in the North. Um, and see some of the community work that had been done on, on that, uh, that they had done in their community. And it was inspiring, um, the level of work that they had done. And I, I'm a little bit sort of ashamed a little bit when, when I went up in North, for example, because I thought, well, you know, on my reserve, three hours North of Toronto, you know, we have one bar of cell service and internet sometimes works or sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I wonder what it's gonna be like up here. When, when I landed in say or um, you know in Uvic, for example, and they had really good internet and there was an infrastructure there and they were using technologies and and I was inspired I, 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 I was inspired by that community and the several of those communities and how they had taken the initiative to do what needed to be done in order to get you know their community healthy again and they had done it in this way and that was really inspiring for me and 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 i, I thought how can i do that what part can i play in that um and so then i came up with uh ciit so um yeah so that is a, a bit of a vision that i had tanya has articulated the vision um and road and jen and leanne my co-founder of akali technologies my private business uh that i've been working on um have all inspired me for this um, and I really really hope that this is also inspiring for people um, and it may be an opportunity where you're not um, you know taking five flights up to the north like I was but I enjoyed it um, but maybe we can get a taste of that here and coming up and really see our youth and 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 the power that they're doing in our communities and how they're using innovative thought and technologies to achieve what their communities or nations are really trying to achieve. So, um, I, you know, thank you so much for having me today, and and I'm so excited. And Cilar, um and Serena 
um, for all of the support from industry. It's a very critical, critical piece in this, in this, in this industry, in this sector. And uh, we really see our industry partners stepping up to the table. So um, I think um, that's all I have for today. Um, Tanya, if we, uh, we have uh, Claudette here. Thank you so much, Miigwech, um, Jared. Um, that, that was a wonderful um, piece of, of, you know, uh, just your own uh, history and, and story um, behind CIT, how you founded it, um, the great inspiration that you've provided all of us. Um, and uh, yeah, Chief uh, Miigwech. So now we have, um, uh, as, as Jared mentioned, um, the Coalition of Innovation Leaders Against Racism, CELAR, um, um, you know, we've been so proud to partner with CELAR uh, in, in terms of supporting their pledge to create pathways for Indigenous peoples, Black people and people of colour in our shared work to dismantle systemic racism and colonialism in Canada's tech and innovation sectors and to really build a more equitable innovation economy for all of us in Canada. So it is my great honor to introduce Claudette McGowan, Chair of CELAR and Global Executive Officer for TD Bank, um, for her to share uh, welcome remarks on behalf of CELAR. Claudette. Thank you very much, Tanya. It's a joy to be here. And I really just want to start by saying something that I've learned in my career is that access and opportunity are game changers. So I'm thrilled to see you focus on Young, innovation, young innovators, and how we can give them more access and more opportunity. So welcome and thank you so much for having me. We launched CELAR, the Coalition of Innovation Leaders Against Racism. This was something that was a, a dream and a passion for Young Wu and Armagon Ahmad. And they are our co-founders. And they saw what was happening in the world. And many of us saw what was happening in the world. I think we had just seen George Floyd murdered there's, there was things every week in all of our communities that we were asking the question, what needs to be done? Who needs to take action? And when they started making calls, over 50 different companies at the highest level said, we can do more, we can do better. And that's really what CELAR is focused on, is how do we make the world more inclusive? How do we help eradicate racism at work, at play, at school, across the country. And so the areas that we focus on are about creating new pathways and transformational opportunities, like a life-changing job opportunity, working in the innovation economy, having a mentor, having a leader, someone who looks like you, someone who doesn't look like you, someone who's had an experience that you wish you could have, helping you to navigate the path and then truly getting access to capital. That was another area that we thought, how do we help businesses thrive? How do we grow businesses? How do we plant the seed and help them to truly grow? And it's access to capital and it's access to revenue. And so as much as it's about getting it started, how do we keep you going? What, what needs to be done? What connections need to be made? What procurement pipelines do you need to be a part of to truly have transformational outcomes? And of course, like you, we're double clicking on youth because we understand that that is our future. And so we have to invest in the people who will be leading tomorrow. I, I love that we focus on women and especially, uh, you know, the women in tech challenge is, is not an easy one to solve. We understand that, you know, over about 25 to 30 percent, if you take a look at who's in technology are women. And it's been like that for a while. So what more can we do to make it truly inclusive and make sure that they're, when women are in, involved, it's involved at all levels. Um, and of course, double clicking on our non-binary communities as well. And so we really wanna make sure that innovation is inclusive and not just with the people, but with what we build, making sure that we're doing things in an ethical way and an inclusive way. And so that's really the focus of CELAR and so the partnership with CIIT is just remarkable. I tip my hat to Jared. I tip my hat to, to Paul and obviously to you, Tanya, for the work that you're doing. Because any movement, any change that happens in this world happens because people make it a priority. When we focus on things, things get done. 
And so I want to just recognize the work that you're doing with the Tech Skills Accelerator, with the research that you're doing, the advocacy work, and of course, the Collaboration Innovation Network. These are all things that are driving us forward, moving the needle, helping us to make progress. And we're here for it all. So on behalf of everybody at CELAR, I want to thank you for the work that you're leading. I look to the youth of today and say, we can do remarkable things. Know that you're supported, know that you're guided, know that you've got that foundation to really grow and build upon. To all the elders for what you do, to light the way, to be the light and remind us of the history, but also help us to create new legacies. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here and I wish you continued success. Oh, thank you so very much, Claudette. I think I can speak on behalf of us by saying you've been such a trailblazer and inspiration to all of us, uh, especially for uh, women of color uh, in, in the sector. And um, yeah, a heartfelt thank you. Um, so now uh, I'll move on in our program. Um, our, our generous uh, sponsor for this event and the in a, uh, the whole Innovator um, Spotlight series has been TD Equity and Innovation Program. It has been an amazing experience uh, for myself and, and for all of us on, on my team to work collaboratively with our next speaker, Samantha Estuista, who manages equity and innovation and programs and leads at TD um, the Equity Resource Hub, which is a platform created at TD Lab. I invite Samantha to share uh, welcome remarks on behalf of TD. Samantha. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, so thank you all for attending today's panel, highlighting some of the most amazing Indigenous young in, uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, here at TD, we're committed to continuing to grow on our ongoing relationships with Indigenous peoples. Uh, we know that much more work is needed to be done on our part on the journey towards truth and reconciliation, inclusive of the continued support of initiatives that promote early learning, enhanced financial education, supporting um, equitable health out outcomes, and also celebrating Indigenous cultures. Um, you know, one of the things that's really integral for this journey is action and commitment. And at the at TD Lab, where I am, equity and innovation is at the core of our innovation cycle. Sponsorships of incredible groups like the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Technology are one of the key ways in ensuring that our inclusive innovation journey continues to grow. And uh, just like Tanya said, I'm incredibly grateful for the partnership that we built together, um, working towards a very common goal, which is meaningful long term impacts in the innovation economy centered on supporting programs that are created by Indigenous people for Indigenous people and communities. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this panel. In, in my role, I have the pleasure of working with youth just starting their career journeys. Um, I have shared with them the impacts that I have felt walking or virtually logging into rooms where I might be the only woman, the only racialized person, the only openly disabled person and so forth. Um, and much of what I try to do in my role as a people manager is to make space for the next generation to feel like they belong in their field of choice. And that there are others in similar journeys and experiences here to walk alongside them. And when people see themselves in roles that they want to explore, they begin to believe that they belong in those roles. And soon one person becomes two person, becomes four people, becomes eight people, and so forth. And simple actions that really do lead to a snowball effect. Uh, the panelists that are speaking here today are doing just this. Um, you know, Indigenous youth across this country will be able to see themselves in the stories shared here, um, leading to feeling like they too have a place as entrepreneurs and innovators. And, you know, I don't think there's much more of an inspiring uh, panel than that. And, you know, with that, I'll just turn it back to our, our wonderful hosts and, and Tanya to kick off the panel. Thank you so much, Sam. Yeah, again, it's it's been such a delight to to learn from you and and collaborate with you. And uh, yeah, we're so much better for it uh, for the partnership. Um, so I now would uh, ha I have the distinct honor of um, introducing you to our panel moderator, um, Michael Veig. He's a very talented young innovator and leader who is the implementation manager for the Health Tribal Council in Bella Bella, British Columbia. 
and uh, I will put it in Michael's very capable hands to take the lead on hosting our Young Innovators panel. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. I'm very thankful that we could gather today in this virtual space. Thank you for, for joining us and thank you, Tanya, and all the others for opening up this panel and, and for coming together to provide this amazing opportunity. My name is Kanistisla, or Michael Vey. I'm from the Heltic Nation, and as Tanya said, I'm the HD Stute Implementation Manager for Heltic Tribal Council. HD Stute is the word that we use for reconciliation, which means to turn things around and make them right again. And it was a way to recognize that reconciliation is commonly described as two parties who've wronged each other making amends, but we didn't feel like that's what happened during colonization. It was a direct impact of colonization upon our people. And so it's up to the crown to make things right. And so we thought HD Stute uh, better represented that and, and, and created a foundation for a new relationship moving forward. And through our HD Stute process uh, since 2017, We've negotiated landmark agreements with Canada and British Columbia that recognize our inherent Indigenous sovereignty over our lands while closing the socioeconomic gap with the rest of Canada. And through these agreements, we have successfully negotiated $65 million for 55 projects focused on housing, our language revitalization, Heishakla revitalization, marine stewardship, economic development, and self governance. And we are really uh, emboldened by this opportunity to find a new pathway forward that recognizes who we are as a people on our own lands and get to a point of the original intention of, of treaties and our relationship with the Crown, which is a equal relationship. I am also an advisor to the Health of Climate Action Team, where we have utilized a community consensus approach that is inherent with our GUI laws, our laws, uh, to identify 10 climate action solutions that gets our community to net zero emissions and remedy some of the longstanding colonial legacy around housing and heating issues that we've had in our community and like so many other indigenous communities face. And, and today I have a distinct pleasure of facilitating our discussion with our very inspiring panelists of young indigenous innovators who are doing amazing things across many different sectors. And when I was thinking about this panel and what, the work that we were doing today, it became apparent to me that innovation is inherent to indigenous societies. Many indigenous societies have existed within their homelands for tens of thousands of years, experiencing virtually an unlimited amount of obstacles, such as climate change, food shortages, and colonization that required many different ways of creating and applying innovative solutions. The development of valuable, enduring technologies that links ideas, people, and landscapes with real world application are at the heart of innovation, which is at heart, at the, at the heart of indigenous societies across the world. And this innovative experience and spirit continues to this day. Our indigenous youth scholars and practitioners are championing, championing and leading some of the most exciting and innovative uh, uh, sustainable innovations across different sectors such as technology, health, housing, food systems, land and water stewardship, education, language, culture, and so much more. Indigenous innovation leaders across Canada are globally are, and globally are transforming their communities to be more self-sustaining and to become leaders in clean energy and nature's inspired, inspired technologies and designs often integrating indigenous and Western technologies and design principles together. Indigenous science, technology, and infrastructural innovation excellence is visibly demonstrated across sectors and professional fields and is being harnessed by indigenous practitioners to transform our communities for the next seven generations and beyond. These innovations model exciting and viable solutions to the complex environmental, climate, health, and socioeconomic challenges facing both indigenous and non-Indigenous communities and cities, and applying them will create a better world for all of our Wawaktus, all of our relatives. And I'm honored today to share this space with some of these Indigenous youth scholars and practitioners for our panel discussion today. We are joined by Nicole Luke, an architectural designer at Vern Reimer Architecture Incorporated, uh, Alicia Aragutak, 
elected executive of McKivick Corporation, Keenan Beavis, founder of Longhouse Media, and Megan Bryan, co-founder of Ashmastawinan Games. Our panelists have graciously made presentations to share their journey with us today. So without further ado, I'd love to pass it over to Nicole. Hello, um, Keanu Meek. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Center for Indigenous Innovation and Technology and everyone involved uh, in planning all this. And thank you, Elder uh, Shelley. It was a beautiful song. Um, my name is Nicole Luke. I am currently uh, an architectural designer um, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory and uh, homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, my family's from the Kivalik region of Nunavut, um, somewhat from Rankin Inlet and a mix in Chesterfield Inlet I'd like to include as well, uh, but born in uh, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories. Um, I grew up in Winnipeg for most of my life and um, I um, had an interest in architecture and among other things. So I did my Bachelor of Environmental Design uh, at the University of Manitoba and completed that in um, 2019 and completed my master's in architecture um, last year. So now I'm working uh, at Fern Rammer Architecture currently, um, but I would have to say I had a wonderful uh, education as well. So um, my, part of my thesis work was looking towards uh, constructing uh, Inuit sovereignty in the Arctic and how uh, climate change will be affecting uh, architectural process and building design in the future um, in terms of permafrost degradation and globalization um, and uh, among other things. So um, part of my thesis work was about um, the inclusion of working on the land and having a um, scientific uh, research station mix. So combining culture uh, and research together, because I think they're they're quite important to learn more from the land and um, from the community as well. Um, so just a bit more of a background um, among working in an office and learning as much as I can. Uh, uh, I hope to become uh, an Inuk architect one day and work on more projects, not just in Nunavut, but all across Inuit Nunangat and the circumpolar regions um, across the world, beyond political borders. Um, and along that, I am a part of the Inuit Futures and Arts Leadership, uh, a fellow there, and I assisted on the uh, Inuit exhibition at Komayok in um, Inuit Art Center in Winnipeg here um, and helped with the exhibition design there as well and currently finishing up a project with the Canadian Centre for Architecture uh, towards home exhibition and um, I uh, assisted with the planning of um, uh, one of the gallery space spaces uh, that asked questions with Indigenous uh, designers and architecture students across um, Canada and the and um, Northern Norway, Finland, and Sweden, um, the, the Sami Indigenous students as well, uh, asking questions how they see the, the future of Indigenous architecture um, and in the Arctic as well. So we are finishing that project up. The exhibition is now open in, in Montreal, so I, I highly recommend checking it out, uh, among other gallery spaces that are um, beautifully curated as well. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me and I'm happy to be here. I just wanted to note, um, I will have to leave a bit early for some family matters. So Kayana Meek for um, accommodating my schedule and I'm really happy to be here among uh, some other amazing uh, panelists as well. So thank you. Yeah, that's okay, Nicole, and thank you for being here with us. Uh, I'd love to pass it over now to Elisa. All right, thank you. Akokme, Nicole, to Kusinak Sietunu, Hartia Ravi, Alicia Ravon, Alicia Rahotak, Omi Rakmio Nunavimi. Thank you. What an honor to be here. And uh, I, I'm very humbled to have been invited to, to this. So 
Um, a little bit of background on me. My name is Alicia. I am uh, a youth from, from Nunavik, the northern region of, of Quebec. I am, I call myself the, I'm a child of our community in, in Nunavik and especially amongst my family. Um, I'm a daughter of a residential school survivor, uh, a granddaughter of um, a relocatee to the high Arctic for the sake of Arctic sovereignty. So I'm, a, I'm an energy and a living proof of, uh, you know, intergenerational um, trauma and I have really uh, lived it growing up. But um, despite that, or all throughout that time, um, I've been, I've, uh, I've went from one family to the other and I've been really groomed to be really um, within uh, our communities in, in Nunavik. So uh, I say that because I'm, I'm a great advocate for, for our region. So I really focus on uh, politics and issues around around our people in Nunavik and, and beyond. Uh, I'm an executive elected member of our ethnic uh, indigenous organization here uh, at Makivik. So I am very honored to um, have been elected to that position. Um, how I got here, I think, you know, um, where I come from and my story and my history and our culture, I think I've started being engaged within our communities in, in, in Nunavik, especially um, I've been a very active uh, citizen for, for our community. So I love mobilization, uh, hence the start of my, my career as, a, as a, the first president of the Hockey Youth Council, which is an ethnic, um uh youth organization so it's a advocacy body and we you know mobilize and mobilize ourselves to confront um our our situations and of course to better advance our communities and to to mobilize so that's um my background and also where this uh have brought me as well was um a very successful project that I was able to um, be part of in leading was the Iswak Civic Regional Recovery Center. Uh, within our realities, in our communities, our indigenous um, people, we often face, you know, unfortunate statistics in our communities, you know, incarceration, alcoholism, and, you know, all of those have roots and stories to where, where these um, situations come from. So I was really driven into the field of trauma and addictions. So um, there's a $40 million, very successful project um, being constructed right now to accommodate families and individuals uh, to have a, a very healthy, a safe place and to work on their, their trauma. So I have been a uh, part of that very exciting, uh, project. So, um, I'm, I'm a mobilizer. I mean, I think what my strength is and what I connect with the most is to be, is to be with our communities, you know, to be frontline in the grassroots level for any initiative to be successful for us or for anyone or any project. I think the key um, key thing that I was able to witness with all of these very exciting positions I've held is to be and listen to the communities, to collect and not to have not to be the amazing person who has all of the answers um, i think our ability and our culture and what was practiced before is to is to work with realities and if you when when you had compiled and and work with very specific uh situation and to adjust i think that ability uh, I have really seen that in any all of the files that I have uh, helped lead. So I'm a great advocate in in being with the people. I think it doesn't get complicated. I think we try and complicate things often to try and find the most innovative way. But I think 
for me is really getting getting back to the basics you know where are we at let's you know let's talk and and just really working with um people is what creates the most successful initiatives and that's something that i really um push for so yeah that's me i've been all over not all over the place but i am really strong in in i feel very very strongly about uh, uh, the files that I have been in, which is, you know, reconciliation, um, land, culture, language, and, and leadership. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, is what I would, um, I come to this conference uh, with. And thank you so much again for I hope this works I think internet in the north is not the greatest but I think this is working well and I am so honored and humbled to be amongst all of you guys thanks again Wallace Gaiasica Alicia for all your hard work and for joining us here today uh, I'd like to now pass it over to Keenan Seems like uh, we had Keenan step away briefly uh, for a moment. Uh, so I'd like to now, uh, oh, there he is. Hey, Keenan. Apologies for that. I just wanted to fill up my water bottle before it's my turn to speak. Totally understandable. I'm really, really happy to be here. And thank you so much, Michael, um, our elder for the awesome song. I'm speaking to you from the unceded traditional ancestral territory of the Katsi Semiamu and Kwantlen First Nation, which is just outside of Vancouver in Langley. And, you know, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I have always been an entrepreneur. I've always been an entrepreneur, but I didn't really know. I thought I was going to be a doctor. I Some of my earliest memories are going door to door I would rip the label off of empty two liter pop bottles, shove some bugs inside and then try to sell them to my neighbors. And I just loved the idea of like, you know, saving my own money and then buying like my first Lego set. And ever since kind of starting that, I've gone through a path of doing small little businesses just on stuff that I find fun. So I did t-shirt stores throughout high school and then Previous to that, I actually had the 27th most viewed YouTube channel in Canada, not because my videos were any good, but because I had a good understanding, a primitive understanding of how like search engine optimization worked. How do I get my video with the keyword trampoline to show up above the other videos? Um, when I got into the t-shirts, uh, I went to one of those comic cons and I noticed that you know, all these people here in these elaborate costumes, they're in these like really elaborate costumes representing whatever fandom they, they're they um, representing. And then there's people like me who is maybe like not that bold. I wouldn't wear anything. So what if there was a good bridge between the two? What if there was like minimalistic t-shirts, minimalistic hoodies that only people of that fandom would understand was from or that was representing what it's um, that uh, TV show, that comic book, whatever it is. So did that for a little while, really learned how to do advertising and search engine optimization. Cause when you're selling shirts, you only have a margin of like five to 10 bucks. Got really good at that. And then got a cease and desist letter from, um, um, from my Pokemon store. So I couldn't do my minimalistic Pokemon shirts anymore. And I got into what I do now which is Longhouse Media. So we are a full service marketing agency and we think marketing should be easy. We think that if you're authentic, you tell your story and your user experience is better than your competitors, you're going to make money. And um, making money doesn't necessarily mean, mean just like businesses, but we work with like nonprofit brands and universities and um, all types of initiatives. Marketing should just be easy and that's what we try to do our slogan is marketing results no headaches and we think that when you represent yourself authentically people are drawn to that
guys for kicking in for your story and sharing a bit about yourself today and, and what Longhouse Media is all about. Much appreciated. Uh, and last but certainly not least, I'd like to pass it over to Megan. Sanze, uh, Megan Bernesikosun, Apatwakosisun, Hamilton, Ontario, Nuchin. Hi, my name is Megan Byrne. I'm Apatwa Kosisan, or uh, federally labeled as Métis in Ontario. And I am a game designer. Um, I do more than just that, but that's sort of like the spaces that I'm in. That's usually what I tell people first is that I'm a game designer. But beyond that, I, I really am a, a person who is interested in how people function and how people work and how community works and how do people interact with things. So more complexly, I'm a user experience designer and my philosophy around user experience design is what we kind of call now trauma informed, which is that when I'm designing things, I look very carefully at not just how do normal or average people behave when they're in a certain scenario or given things to do, but how, because of the longstanding effects of colonialism, of capitalism, of various things that have caused damage, have created, um, you know, individualism as being like the most important thing in our society in North America right now, how has that kind of changed people's way of interacting with things? And I feel like right now has been a very exciting time in games because there has the barrier to entry has dropped quite low. That being said, I'm always very careful to remind people, as so the other panelists have said, internet in the north is not great and not consistent or reliable. And a lot of software is going ever closer to be perpetually online. And so, you know, it's like we had this great barrier drop and everybody jumped in and then decided they'd bring the barrier up. So that's one of the things that I do is with my work and my games is I try to think about how can people access my work. And so with Hill Agency, which is a project my studio, Achimastawastan Games, is working on right now, you know, we think about it's an Indigenous cyber noir. It's specifically made for Indigenous people, but of course, like everybody is welcome to come play it. How do we get it in the hands of Indigenous players, especially when they're dealing with uh, issues of access? And so those are some of the things that I do. Uh, my studio, Achimastawastan Games, I founded that way back in 2017, I think, uh, when I was still in college. Uh, I did it because somebody told me like, oh, you can apply for funding, you know? And I was like, what? I, I didn't know, even though I was in game studies, that the Canadian government and the various different provincial and territorial governments have their own funding for interactive digital media. So that's why I started the company. I don't think I ever really wanted to be a entrepreneur. I don't think I really wanted to run my own business. I can do it. I do it well, but that's not really why I do it. I do it because the system that we're under does not allow for people to own their own IP that, you know, if you're going to go work for a large company, they essentially get to own everything you do. And even though that wouldn't have happened without you, you never really get to share in the profits of that. And so for me, especially as an indigenous person, especially working in video games, it was very important to me that I, you know, protected that IP. Uh, I think a lot, everyone here can kind of, or already knows about the long history of indigenous people basically being content mines for, you know, our traditional knowledge and stories and songs. And then that somebody took that and then made a profit off of it. And it's not so much that I'm concerned with maintaining or, or controlling a profit. It was more about it's very important for me, um, especially because of how you know I was raised and the the way I was you know, taught pro protocols and such was that it's very important for me to maintain control over my stories. And if my studio wants to kind of grow and create space for other Indigenous people to, you know, make their stories and put them out in the world, it's very important that they're able to sort of control those stories. And so we think very you know, heavily on protocols of ownership and protocols of sharing and who is allowed and who is not allowed and how and access and these kind of things. So these are some of the things that I kind of struggle with on the daily. Um, when I'm not making video games, um, one of the things that I'm 
very invested in is teaching, teaching video games to Indigenous students or any students. Right now, I'm an instructor at York University. Um, I also am very conscientious of, you know, the ever-growing class divide and the lack of resources for not just the very poor, but everybody. And so I'm very invested in building up systems of support in my home city of Hamilton. Um, one of my big things is that you, know, you need to take care of your neighbors. You need to make sure that the people around you are, are fed and clothed and housed. And so for me, like that's really important is that I'm not just making art and, and video games, I love that, but that I'm also sort of putting back into my local community as much as possible. So that's kind of a, I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot. I do a lot of things. Um, I also do my own art. So the piece behind me that you see is actually a piece that I did as a prototype of a prototype that I'm trying to work on, which is a 15 minutes into the future post-pollution indigenous city. Uh, and it's literally just a, a roof on a building with a wildflower garden that you can sit in and watch the moon while you kind of listen to the the night sounds. So I, it's called a night call. Um, but yeah, this is the kind of stuff that I do. I like to think about how can we make things better? And then I go out and I'm like, how do I, how can I action that? So that's what I do. Well, Skyessica, Megan, very inspiring work. I'm so glad that you're creating that space for our indigenous peoples, your, your, yourself uh, in, the, in the tech and gaming space. Wallace Guy Essica for that. And Wallace Guy Essica to all of our panelists for joining us today and for your very inspiring presentations to open our panel today. Uh, I'd like to follow up with your, uh, with your opening introductions with my own uh, question for you all, which is in your own words, how would you describe indigenous innovation in your field? And we'll just do this popcorn style. You can jump in whenever you feel like you've got an answer. I'll take the, the first stab at it for sure. So I work in marketing and marketing is all about, you know, getting people to know about your brand, getting people to buy your product and indigenous people as a whole, they understand this. And I think it's because culturally storytelling is so important. I'm sure Megan's going to jump in on storytelling for sure, but storytelling and marketing is what makes people buy. You know, it's why everyone wants the iPhone. It's why everyone wants the iMac and they're not too excited about the Android phone or the um, PC, right? Um, Apple really um, kind of flipped marketing on its head, but I think indigenous people have kind of had the idea that Apple had for thousands of years. Um, what Apple really did with the iPod is they switched the order of how they present marketing. So they start with their why statement. Traditionally, it was always like what the product is, how the product works, and then why they made the product. Apple switched that to, you know, why we made the product. So bringing the world together through music. How? Through innovative technology. And then what? The iPod. And I think Indigenous people have this idea of like everything needs a why, you know? Like, why are we working together? You know, why are we, uh, why do we do this? Well, maybe it's because of, you know, migratory patterns or weather, like seasonality. Like there's so much why in indigenous culture. And I think that um, indigenous people are uniquely positioned to take the marketing world by storm today. Jessica Keenan, for your for your brave first response and to jumping first to the plate, much appreciate that. And I, I agree. You know, we've we've had so much of our intention. Uh, you know, for for us as Celtic Nation, we draw on our gui loss, our laws, onto why we do anything that we do. And I think we can all uh, resonate with the idea that uh, a lot of our nations are are oversubscribed and in, in, in men capacity. All of us are wearing multiple hats. And so asking that why is really in, in critical before we embark on anything. And so thank you for, for opening that up, Keenan. And I'd love to, to pass it back over to anyone who has a further uh, answer to that question. Um, I can add on to that. Um, 
in the best way I can. Um, I think for me, uh, this idea of Indigenous innovation in the field, I think in general is, um, it's all about the process. And I think that that also goes to say with the storytelling and that extra connection between people. Um, for designing, you have to talk to, you have to know who you're designing for and you have to um, design with them as well. And I think at least in my field, there's this idea of a star architect is what we call it. And they're like celebrities. And that's not the point of the building you're creating and you're, you're, you're building this for other people and fostering this environment. And you want to make sure it's appropriate for um, many people in many instances. So this idea of storytelling and connecting is, is crucial to understanding what you're creating as well. And then not only th does it benefit the project it benefits the process and um, I think the the project is the process and you need to um, the better the process then the better relationships the better the um, create whatever you're creating um, and the end result will become so it, it's um, it's a storytelling aspect is uh, I agree is key mm. yeah, that's kind of cool I, I completely agree the storytelling is, is critical and, and the stories maintain centered around the people and the benefit of the people. I absolutely agree. I think for, so for video games, I would say, I don't even know if we can talk about innovation yet because it's like one of the things that we're in the middle of right now is just a battle to let our voices be heard over sort of like uh, settler voices who are like, oh, let us put you in our game. Um, we'll dictate everything. We'll bring on cultural con like you know, consultants and stuff, but essentially like we own all of it. And I don't even mean that in the sense of literally the owning it. It's like even the storyline, it's like they control. So for us, it's uh, how do we how do we create a space where we can be heard? And a lot of that we realize is around we have to build a community that supports one another. and we have to be there for each other. and when, one person is sort of falling behind and their voice isn't being heard that the rest of us kind of lift them up. And that's very difficult um, because we're very encouraged in video games to kind of like think of yourself um, or just think of the player. Like there's not really that space for community beyond kind of like, oh, we went to an event together. And so for us, uh, so I, I, one of the other things I do is I co-coordinate a group called the Indigenous Game Devs, which is an international collective of Indigenous people working in games. And, you know, we've got people from all over the world, um, you know, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, um, the Netherlands, or sorry, sorry, the, the Nordic countries, South America, North America. And, you know, we're all dealing with the same problem. And so for us, having that space to be respected and listened to and not questioned that is like the sunlight we need to grow so we're sort of still in a seed phase where we're just we've got everything we're, we're ready for air we've got the nutrients we just need the space the light and the water and so i think that's one of the things we got right now is at least we got the sunlight uh we're working on the other <laughs> Yeah, Essica, Megan, that's super important to remember that before we even get to a, a, a space of creativity and innovation, we need that space to, to simply be and, and craft that space uniquely and have the, the, the capital that, that Claudette mentioned, access to, to that initial seed funding to, to even enter the space of creativity. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, those, those basic foundations need to be met before you can launch into that. So I think it's a really important distinction that you've made, Megan. Thank you. And, and uh, last but certainly not least, Alicia, I see your your mic is unmuted, so please go ahead. Oh, thank you. No, but I think it's all of what everyone's saying. I think Indigenous innovation, um, it's always been there. But for me, like what I have gone through, I think always are the new ways, definitely back to basics. But also something that I've seen as well is really merging the two. And it really requires, you know, vulnerability on both ends, like the indigenous people and also also the modern world. I think there needs to be a lot of flex and to merge both of these, I think is something that 
um, I called innovative because it really creates something different. You know, it, we were saying, you know, within our practices in the in the trauma world, when we were merging both the cultural aspects and the modern practices, we created a little monster and it was cr amazing. Like it was so exciting to see something new out of, you know, um, uh, so things that have always been there, you know, I think it's working with the both and yeah, that's something that I, I wanted to weigh in on. Thank you. Jessica, Alicia, I, I completely agree. You're using uh, what I think is commonly called two-eyed seeing to create better outcomes and realities for our people and uh, and really expanding what we mean by innovative. You know, these, these you know, practices of seeking new ideas uh, from the basic to the complex is innovation. It's something that I think we've done as Indigenous people since time immemorial. So thank you all for your, for your comments. Um, my next question is, as a young innovator in your field and in your community, what is the most important and inspiring thing you've learned on your journey so far? I could start and um, I, just based on my experience, I mean, I think as a, a young, young innovator, um, you have an idea to be a leader, a mobilizer within your community. So you often have, you know, like the idea of having all of the answers. I think something that that is really uh, sticking to me is my ability to listen. Um, I think that's the most important aspect of being able to move forward, you know, going to our future and working with, with your people, I think. And it's really, you know, basic, but also for me that, that, that is something that I see in, in leaders or often, you know, mobilizers that are able to, to get things rolling is the ability to listen. And, you know, you don't have all of the answers, but the answers come to you or the plan just works out when you have that ability to listen. So I, I would, yeah, say that about um, the importance of, of that. Thank you. That's okay, Alicia. I think for me, what I've learned is you actually you need two things. One, you need to have a really strong sense of yourself, uh, especially in arts. You'll go in and there'll be so many voices, powerful voices who will try to push and nudge and get you to go in certain directions that they think are right. So you have to have a really strong core. And if you feel that like getting weak, just go back to community uh, and take a break because you're gonna need to do that. And it's it's very much a come and go. I think also you need to not let not let FOMO happen. So the fear of missing out, you have to kill it. Um, you cannot let someone pressure you or push you or or make them work make you work on their timetable. Um, you know, it's this opportunity will come around again. I think that's a scary thing for a lot of young innovators. They think if I don't say yes now, it's never coming back. No, no, say no. I mean, you know, say no in a respectful way, of course. Don't be like, why are you telling me this? I don't have time for this. But be like, you know, no, I can't make it right now. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And for me also, like how they respond to you saying no is a very good indication of if you want to keep working with this person. If that person comes back to you like, I'm giving you a great opportunity. How dare you turn this down? You do not want to work with that person. If they come back with like, totally understand. Everything sucks right now. We'll, we'll meet again next year then you're like, yeah, I want to keep working with that person. So, you know, know yourself and hold your, hold your boundaries. They are very important and they will keep you from, <laughs> they will keep you from the burnout most of the time. Guys, to come, Megan. I can imagine in your industry, Megan, that, um, you know, you get locked into a bad project. It's uh, the development cycle of a game is much longer than the development cycle of a website. So I, I sympathize, but no, you, that advice is really good. Um, I got into my line of work when I was like 18 and I grew a mustache <laughs> because people would take me a little bit more seriously. Me, this might not be useful for, you know, Nicole, Alicia and Megan, 
but um, yeah, no, grow a mustache. That is um, my best advice. No, no. Um, but seriously, it's actually kind of an extension of what Megan was saying. It's just like, know what you enjoy working on. And if you enjoy what you're doing, the money comes, you know, obviously, you, as you mentioned earlier, like the hierarchy of needs, like, yes, you need to eat. Yes, you need to, the money will come and, you know, save up. You could do a couple like hard, 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 bad projects. But after that, just do what you're passionate about and the bigger opportunities will come. Um, just to add to that, um, I think for me is maybe this sounds a little um, like simple and uh, kind of like, of course, that makes sense. But um, just being told that you, you can do it. And I think for most Indigenous innovators and students, it it seems very hard to just be in a place that, um, especially institutions that you're, you're allowed to be there and you can make space and just being told that like, yeah, you can, you can do this and you're allowed to do this and explore. I think that is key to be encouraged in that way. And I mean, maybe it's easier said than done, but um, just hearing that and having that extra support is really helpful. Um, another thing that I've, I've learned too is learning to uh, enjoy the challenges and find uh, finding that challenges are actually more helpful for learning. Um, it, it seems hard at first, but wanting to learn more from the challenges is, is really key because it also keeps you sane in a way as well. <laughs> Can I second Nicole and to all of you, I, I, I think a, a lot of your advice it certainly comes from personal experiences and, and experiences I've had as well. And, and I think you offer up some great advice for all of our young innovators that are watching this to make sure they're setting their boundaries. Don't let imposter syndrome or FOMO stop you from being confident, uh, making sure that you're you're listening. You know, the common phrase is two, eyes, uh, two ears, one mouth. Uh, and, and I've definitely tried to employ that as best I can and, and just following your passions and you know the, the rest will come. So I think that's some great advice for our young innovators. My next question is, uh, many young people want to be the catalyst of change, yet struggle to find that aha moment. Uh, what would you recommend to individuals in this stage of their professional journey? One piece of advice that I, I read and it really clicked for me is a lot of people want to change the world, but they can't even clean their bedroom to start. Um, really, st and it's not about just cleaning your bedroom, it's about focus on yourself first. The better you can make yourself, the more able you're going to be to actually change the world. I think people need to start small because that growth will allow you to do much bigger things. Yeah, I, I agree with some of that. I, I think also like, yeah, like the starting small for sure. And for me also starting small means make sure you're building your community, not just, you know, the community you live in, but your community of peers. Um, I think too often we fall into the hero's journey idea of being an innovator is like, I have to do this by myself. Nobody does this by themselves. What we've fallen into is a sort of cult of personality where the, you know, the auteur. And I was like, but if you look at the real stories behind those auteurs, they're supported by so many people who helped or did part of the work. So, you know, think, don't think of yourself as alone. Sort of think of yourself more as, I got an idea, who wants to come with me? So, you know, get your, get your sort of team, uh, get your, if the people who are excited about your idea, who want to see it happen. And, and in some ways also consider that you need to give off a bit of ownership of that idea to them and it will come back to you so much better. So I find that with games all the time. Sometimes a lot of designers who start, they're really afraid to work as a team, to give any ownership to other people on the team. Hill Agency is a fantastic example of, I had an idea and then I brought in my team and I was like, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to bring? And like what I got back was so much better than what I could have imagined. So, you know, be be the idea that sparks something, but also, you know, be part of something. Don't just be alone. Be part of, you know, a group, uh, a team, a plan. You know, that's important. 
I think I'll weigh in um, from there as well. I think when you have a, an aha moment, you have the aha moment doesn't fly to you while you sit and wait. You know, you have to throw yourselves out there. There's so many opportunities, and I think um, what I what I would definitely recommend is to don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, we often often feel like, oh, I have an idea but I don't want to fail or make mistakes. And I think a lot of, a lot of youth or people in general are, you know, not trying and just the ability to, you know, explore it, that curiosity to feed your curiosity. And it's completely safe to make mistakes and you adjust. And, you know, that I, I find that, you know, throwing yourself to be in, in groups or, you have to give yourself um, a chance to make mistakes here and there. It adjusts, it builds experience, and then, as you know it, you know that your aha moment might have happened like last year. But you have to, you know, make steps and expose yourself a bit. I think that's something that I would say. You know, it's okay to make mistakes. These are great, actually. You know, I encourage my 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 friends and youth at they make mistakes you learn that's how you grow so yeah that's go make mistakes <laughs> i i completely agree i think you that's one of the best teachers is creating mistakes and um even if you don't realize it and again that goes towards these challenges that you need to um work towards and work on um, some of my uh, best ideas and also stress relievers is to take a step back too when when that happens and just letting letting it sit if it's been a long day at school or at work I go for a walk or I do something to keep my mind off of it because it, you need to give yourself a break and you need to rest too and being able to reflect back on that and uh, cope with that I think is really helpful and that's where you get your your, your drive and your best ideas. Guys, look at all of you, Matt, where were you guys in my early career stage? I got to all of this and save myself a lot of grief. I think, I think you're absolutely right. You know, we got to take core care of that core ourself. And, you know, as you said, Megan, in your last question, you know, go and come back when you're, when you're ready. So you can take care of yourself and uh, don't be afraid to, to, to fail because you can still fail forward. And that's all a part of the journey. And I think we, we uh, I know for me and a lot of my peers, there's a lot of uh, focus on early success and being super productive. And it's not going to always be able to fall on you. And I think you guys are just really reaffirming that and validating that that experience needs to come from these moments of, of not not always being 100 percent. And that's OK. That's 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 normal. So thank you for that. Uh, my next question is, uh, how can the principles and actions of truth and reconciliation be prioritized by tech and innovation leaders and institutions? I'll just very basically, I mean, like we could be, I could feed this discussion for so long, but I think knowing the situations right like the the trc recommendations all of those i mean like they're there i think first first thing basic just get to know them um learn them feel them i think that's very uh important i think i've seen a lot of attempts to all right let's start moving forward but you know they don't really know what 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 the means are or the the recommendations are in terms of you know uh the truth and reconciliation they, they want to lead it and take it and they're excited but often they don't know all of these recommendations so that's very basic get to know the the you know what has happened you know what's out there there's so many compilation of of evidence and, you know, the VA commissions, the TRC, the UNDRIPS, you know, all of that. I think reading and content learning is really important. 
Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I could I could go on about this topic. Um, I had to do a, a little piece for um, the Canadian Centre for Architecture um, on the publication of our exhibition, and I talk about reconciliation and the industry and how it's more than just a, a title that's bolted and underlined a part of your report. It's not, that's not the end goal. It's, and maybe I'm reiterating myself is like, it's about the process. Like, what are you doing? Um, how do you want to foresee this? And it's just building relationships and building capacity and um, truly caring for um, whoever you're working with and either professionally or friendships. Um, and just getting to know community more. <clears throat> I think that's like a, that's the key thing. And again, easier said than done, but it, it's important and it should be made important. Just so I can best answer the question, would you mind saying it one more time for me, Michael? Absolutely, no problem. Uh, how can the principles and actions of truth and reconciliation be prioritized by tech and innovation leaders and institutions? Yeah, so I think, Launching off of something Nicole said, I, she said a word that I think is really relevant is relationships. And I think at the leadership level, focusing on developing real relationships and not kind of surface level things, not to fill a quota, but like focus on real relationships. And you're going to be able to affect change so much stronger and more meaningfully. And then as a leader, um, raise the next generation of leaders with those same values. And then you're going to affect not just change in the now, but generational change. This one's actually hard because I've had a lot of conversations with like, you know, especially in the, in like the digital media sector. And I think what, we keep coming back to is the fact that a lot of these industries they don't even respect themselves so it's very hard for them to respect others so when i say that i mean there's not really a very healthy con uh, understanding of consent in digital um like in software development that you know you don't say no to investor you don't say no to your boss like you know, you can say no, but you can't say no. And this is a this is an endemic problem in the industry. You know, how can you be respectful to indigenous community members or indigenous partners if you're not even being respectful of your own self, of your own energies, if you don't even have the ability to say no to your own industry? So that's one of the things that we've talked about, about how, you know, it's not something you do to or for others. You need to examine the patterns in your own space. How are you replicating these very unhealthy patterns that then you are doing to others? Cause you know, we've had that conversation about like, well, we had this really great project. We wanted to work with this community, but they said no. And like, how dare they? And I'm like, why, you know, where's that coming from? Why do you feel like, how dare they? Where's that coming from? And then you get, and then they start talking about it. And they're like, well, I'm not allowed to say no to my investor who's pushing for this project. And you're like, whoa, what's going on there? So that's the thing I think is also happening that we're, you know, we're, there are these policies, there's these ideas, and they're not even doing it for themselves because they see it as something for uh, somebody else. They see it as just, oh, it's just for Indigenous people. This is just for Indigenous people. I was like, a lot of the stuff that happened here was because of an intrinsic value system in the settler colonial state. If you can't break that, mindset how are you supposed to fulfill these actions because you're going to always see them as either lesser or not something that needs to be applied to you so you know this is this is such a yeah it's like you could talk about this forever but this has really been a reoccurring thing where and i, I you know what i'm actually really thankful that i'm seeing in a lot of indie studios they're like i need to prioritize healthy consent making in business and now I'm not seeing that anger when they reach out to an Indigenous community, like, hey, we'd like to do a project with you. And they're like, no, thanks. You're like, no problem. And that's great. That's actually really healthy because it didn't used to be like that. I remember myself being kind of pulled into things and they're like, make them say yes. And I'm like, absolutely not. So, you know, that's that's definitely something I'm seeing. I, I, would, I think we could have an entire 
three-day panel just about this subject, though. I completely agree, Megan. And uh, thank you to all of you for, for your very thoughtful and insightful responses to that question. It's one that's, that's I think, near and dear to all of us. Um, and I think you're, you're all bang on with creating a culture of consent and just decolonizing this space is inherent to being able to take action on, on the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I, I thank you all for your, for your responses. Um, my next question, I'm gonna skip one actually, and I wanna jump into this one just based on the conversation. Uh, in your experience, what are valuable ways that you and other indigenous people are contributing to and leading the innovation sector? What are some really key ways you've seen that happen? And I know there's a lot, so I'm asking you to filter down a little, probably a little bit, but any, any example from your own experiences would be great. Um, I think for me, it's, it's hard to say just because I am so new in this industry and I'm still learning. Um, so the first challenge there is trying to absorb and learn as much as I can, but also, and take up that space, but don't take up too much space because I'm still learning as well. Um, so I think that that's just the one comment I have, but I'm still, I'm still learning. And I think encouraging that as well is the main thing and having that, um, everyone to have that empathy that everyone's still talking and learning and there's still so much opportunity that could be built on this as well. What we're trying to do at Longhouse is partner with as many Indigenous people, Indigenous organizations as possible. Um, it's a cliche for a reason, but the rising tide raises all ships. And I think the more of these connections, like, you know, I'm meeting all of you here today. Um, and these partnerships, like we might not partner right now, but if we stay in touch, it might be five years down the line, 10 years down the line, 30 years down the line, one of you might be prime minister. I don't know. And like having these connections and these partnerships is something that will really help create much deeper innovation. And I, I'll hop onto your train on that one. I think lead, leaders, innovators, when they're in positions, they just kind of disappear. Like they, they hold the title and they, you can obviously they, you don't see them anymore all of, a, all of a sudden. But I think um, what I see most valuable is being, you know, around people within the population. I think this is something that's so that i see so attractive in you know in leadership when an individual or a leader is able to be with the people and not just disappear i think that's so valuable and i've seen that um so much within our communities and beyond so just exposure and just you know have the pulse of of whatever you're initiating or leading Yeah, I think just jumping off what everyone said, I think right now what I'm doing is planting seeds. Like I'm just kind of like all over the place and that's relationships, possible future contracts, that kind of thing. Just be like, you know, sometimes it's as simple as just reaching out to an organization or a person I really respect and being like, hey, I'd like to do something with you. And sometimes I get no email back and other times I'm like, oh my God, I'm a fan or yes, let's do stuff. The I'm oh God, I'm a fan is always such a weird response when I'm like, oh, senpai noticed me um so it's like really uh, it's really about sort of setting the groundwork and sort of having i have an idea for what i want in the future but right now i'm kind of going like let's grow here let's grow here let's grow here and let's see what blooms in a year or two or five and uh and then when it comes it'll come and and so i, I think that comes back to that first point i made about like you know don't worry about the fear of missing out get rid of that because it's slow and you know what the thing about slow growth is it's stable and slow growth stays so you know deep roots those are those are like the good plants and so it's like that's how I think about things like that where it's like you know I want to be around for a long time I want to be making games for a long time I want to be making games with other people for a long time and that means I'm gonna take my time so that's 
it's hard though. It's really hard. You want things right now. And so that's a reminder to myself of like, this is innovation. This is, you know, we don't think this way in business. You, I am doing something different. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely agree. You know, I, Alicia, uh, you talked about, you know, keeping yourself accessible to the people that you, that you do your work on behalf of. And I think Keenan, you know, that speaks to your point as well as, you know, be building that network, building that community around your purpose and making sure that you're still willing to, to always be learning. You know, I think, you know, if you're a leader, you're a lifelong learner and you are, you're signing up for continuously taking in new information and trying to, to hear the, the pulse of the people, the needs of the people and, and realize those. So I, com I completely agree. Uh, my next question is is about the why. Um, so the question is, why is the combination of technological and social innovation important to increase social outcomes for Indigenous nations and communities? I think I'll just speak on this because I will have to head out right away. But um, why is it important? Um, I, I'm not sure if there's an exact answer for that, but I think it it's to build capacity, it's to allow communities to gain their sovereignty. And that's the th thing that I'm, I'm really passionate about is um, having Indigenous communities, remote or urban, to have their own sovereignty and be able to create the decisions that they want, not just based on the structure that they're uh, in, in now. And it, it's not our decisions, it's, it's our community um, aspect that we we want to help and it's um again it's the collaboration and uh i think this concept of sovereignty is really important um i do have to head out right away so i just want to thank you everyone i'm sure i'm uh i think this conversation is more than capable of continuing strongly so thank you very much it's been an honor yeah it's okay nicole for your time today much appreciated what do you see can bye nicole I'll jump in to keep the momentum going because this is one that um, I actually get mad at, at um, this question because I hear it asked of politicians all the time and they don't, they answer and then they don't do anything about it. You know, um, the stat, I, I did pull it up just so I could actually say the actual stat, but 76% of households in Indigenous communities don't have access to meaningful internet connections. So what that is, is over a certain amount of megabits per second. 76% don't have access to that in Canada. So that's a problem when you're talking about how can these people be um, um, economically self-reliant? How can they take charge of economic development in their communities? 76% of households can't run Zoom meetings as efficiently as counterparts in urban centers. And when you're doing business, we're on, we're on a, a broadcast right now. Certain people can't do that. 76% to be precise. And that's a problem. So I think that technological innovation, hopefully that keeps up um, because the more uh, technological innovation we get, the less we need to rely on politicians to actually do the right thing. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head on that one. Um, thank you, Starlink. I'm able to like, this is a new experience for me, um, being able to, you know, actually conversate and, you know, make sense. <laughs> um, but that's the thing, like, technological innovation is so important, especially for a small, small populated people like us it's so impactful and it's so easy like my my five-year-old daughter you know the the language uh vocabulary that she's abs absorbing off youtube it's so strong and if we're able to you know merge you know culturally language wise i mean like it's it's a whole nother world and it's so it's like wildfire. I can't keep up with my language and what I'm trying to educate my, my child. I feel so slow because the technological world is way faster than, you know, how I'm able to, to, to keep up and to efficiently um, 
educate my my child our own very languages so i think it's very very important access access yes and you know finding these innovative ways what a what an amazing group like gaming indigenous language like megan and you know all of you guys you guys are doing so amazing and it's something that we're really really behind on and no one's really working on it it's crazy so very important and yeah i can't speak enough of that although i'm not an expert at all in you know technological world but it has such impact on on our identity and our language it's powerful i, I actually i'm so torn because i feel like what uh i'm seeing is you know very similar to the railroad and the roads that sort of forced reliance on a particular network and one of the things that I'm really pushing for in my own sectors is like, you know, how do you make true equality? It's like you give people what they need, not what you think they want. Um, but it's hard to find out what do you need? What do you actually need? And, you know, you think about things like, you know, uh, at least at your community, you know, what would be, what would be things that we could do or already have had that we can do right now? that kind of doesn't rely on these like, you know, corporate interests. And, you know, I think about things that we've lost like intranets, like intranet is essentially every computer in a community wired together. And then you only need one point of intranet. And that's not really talked about in a lot of fields because we've gotten so used to the city model where it's like, well, everybody has access to this. And the thing about an intranet that is so amazing is you can have your own servers, you can have your own programs, you can teach your own software, you can literally download stuff or bring in software. Like another one of the things that I was bringing up earlier is, you know, we're, this is a problem with the perpetually online, like that cuts out a lot of people. And, you know, we think like, oh, we just need to give them more. And I was like, well, why don't we do the online perpetually less? And I don't mean that in terms of like things like Zoom. I'm thinking more about like specifically software. Like, why do you need to have a subscription to Adobe? You know, you used to be able to download or go to the store and buy a program and bring it home. And you could use that and you didn't have to be online for that. And, you know, we, we lose things when we kind of assume that like the way that the system is, is like the best way the system could be um, because we tend to not question it. And so like, I absolutely believe that having connection through the internet has been fantastic. I also think there's other systems that we could be looking at that, you know, do improve sovereignty. You know, if, if, a, if a nation has full control over their network and servers, then I can't think of anything more awesome for that community because now they've got all the benefits of being connected online without any kind of the uh, other people are controlling what they're allowed to have access to, what they're allowed to do with their system, um, you know, taxing them or charging them for things that they can essentially do for free. So these are these are questions that I, I feel like I'm sometimes the only one bringing them up because I, 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 my dad's a network administrator. So he has a private server that he does things with and he showed me how it worked. And I was like, this is dead easy. Why doesn't everybody have one of these? And he's like, nobody teaches it. Nobody sh talks about it. You know, it's easier to put in fiber and then just be like, have your own computer. So like, I'm always like pushing, who knows? In maybe five years, I'm like that, that plan, dumb. This plan, better. Like, that's how we innovate, right? We like, we put out our ideas. We like, here, this is what I think we should be doing. And then someone's like, I think we should do something different. And then you're like, maybe we could do something third. And that's the difficulty and and beauty of technology. And like indigenous people have always used tech. Like that was the other thing is like this idea that like, oh, tech is new. I was like, well, I mean, tech is anything that is a tool that makes your life easier. Um, I think one of the things as a user experience designer, I'm always very conscientious of is it is very easy for a society to create disability through, you know, um, like what we call manufactured disability through forcing a particular system. Like if you think about stairs, you know, why does every building have stairs? Do we need stairs? Like you could use gently ramping uh, 
sorry, gent gently uh, graded ramps. Like that is totally a thing that could exist, but stairs was used first and then it became the norm and it manufactured a disability. You know, if we don't need stairs, let's replace them. So it's the same thing with like, I think with any tech, it's like, let's see if it works. If it doesn't work or if it causes more problems than it solves, or if it's causing more harm than it's worth. I think that's a very important conversation to have about any kind of technology. Sorry for my rant. <laughs> no, no, it's it's great. Gaiasica, Megan, and then all of you for your for your thoughtful remarks on that question. And I think that goes to the heart of not innovating for innovation's sake. It's making sure that the the work that we put out there in the world is considering the the deep needs and not the wants, but the needs of, the, of our of our communities in, in particular in this context. And that I think engaging communities and putting them in the driver's seat of what these look like will allow for these other innovative solutions that we're not even thinking about to, to come to light and make sure that whatever system is put in place is designed for and by the people. So I, I, com I completely agree. Um, we have to uh, jump to our last question today. It's been such a good dialogue that I gotta, I gotta jump down a little bit. Um, so I'd love to know quickly from all of you guys, um, if there's anything, uh, if given the chance, what would you tell your younger self? You know, I'm going to take a bit of a like a, a different approach to this questions. And I've been asked this one, variations of it before. And I've always said, you know, like, you know, start on the business younger, you know, get that compound growth earlier. But I'm kind of changing my mind a bit. Like, just have some fun. You know, you're you're young, you're a kid, make sure you do all the traveling that you want to do, focus on your friendships, focus on your family relationships. Um, while you're young, you have the energy to do all of that. And I think that that's what I would tell my younger self is just um, be easy on yourself. You have the rest of your life to, to work as hard as possible. Now that I'm doing 12, 14 hour days, building something that I'm really proud of, I don't regret that at all. I enjoy it. It's like it's like a video game to me, Megan. I am I'm very addicted to, you know, growing longhouse media and building something to be proud of that uh younger Keenan probably could have relaxed a little bit more, just a little bit. For me, I would tell my younger self, definitely just accept who you are. Don't try to be anyone else. I think now that I am really comfortable with my story, my package, my history, my family, my lineage, like now that I have accepted that, it's so much easier. Like you're comfortable with yourself, you get comfortable with mistakes or you get more courageous I think it, if I could have allowed myself to be me and not try to be you know anyone else I think that would have given me such uh, an easier um, an easier way or like you know just being able to move forward I think confidence in myself yeah yeah, little Alicia, like, it's okay to be you. You're the best <laughs> at being you. You don't need to be anyone else. So that's um, that's a message to a little Alicia. <laughs> I want to cry. Yeah, I think mine's <laughs> a little... I. It's hard when you look back because you're like, well, if I told myself to do something, would I have gotten where I am now? Um, but I think what I maybe would have said is uh, I didn't need to run away for so long. I didn't need to leave for so long. Like um, there were supports there. Um, I just couldn't see them. Uh, so I think I would have I would have given myself that be like, you know, you, you didn't have to run away for such a long time, you could have come back earlier, the things were here, uh, you would have had space. But, you know, we're, we're all kind of dealing with our own trauma. And it's, it's, you know, it comes like you, the healing comes when it comes if you're looking for the healing, and you're working on the healing, it comes when it comes. So I don't know if I want to, <laughs> you know, uh minimize young megan's work 
that she did. But I think if I could have been, if it could have been an adult who had been like, it's okay, there's community here, you're, you know, they are here, it's just you gotta dig a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that would have, I think that would have made it a little bit easier. Now I cry. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful advice. I, I, you know, I, I, if there's anyone like you guys in my corner when I was little, Mike, you know, I'd, I'd be in really good hands, good aunties and uncles. So I appreciate you guys' thoughtful insights and, and wearing your hearts here today and, and for, for being authentically you and, and being a part of this conversation. I, I really enjoyed just sitting here at this space and, and sharing this with you, with you all. And, and I hope that we cross paths in the future. And uh, thank you to uh, all of the sponsors and the Center for Indigenous Innovation for creating this space so that we can have this conversation. And um, we, we were able to, to, to just touch on so many different things. And I, and I think, you know, when I heard this conversation, I, in the back of my head, as, as you know, just resonated so deeply with me, like, yep, definitely been there, you know, whether it's working with my community or in a, in a totally different space that's, that's, that's non-Indigenous, and the, I think these some of these are 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 almost universal experiences for Indigenous peoples and community. I think hearing from leaders like yourselves and passing this knowledge on to other uh, Indigenous innovators and leaders that are listening today, I think you've done a great service for our collective community. So I just want to say Wallace Guy Essica for taking the time and sharing your journey with here with us today. I'd love to now pass it back over to Tanya for closing off our session today. Oh, thank you. You guys are just truly awesome. Like it, um, yeah, I, I, I think we're all incredibly moved. So um, I wanted to say an immense Nakamik Wallace Gaishka Gaishika. Sorry, Michael, my tongue got a little tied there. Marcy, hey, hey, Mikwich, thank you, Nguyen. Merci and thank you to all of our brilliant and inspiring young speakers, Michael, Alicia, Nicole, Megan, and Keenan. Um, you've so generously and, and movingly shared the knowledge, transparency, courage, challenges, and triumphs, uh, e expertise, wise practices, and stories with us that feed and drive your innovation, your creativity, your leadership, your initiatives. Um, you've shared so much heart, as, as Michael just said, and, and shed much needed truth and light, uh, I think, on the values uh, the passion, relationships, learning, and pathways that many young people uh, are experiencing in the sector, or if they're not yet there and are interested, will likely experience in, in spheres such as tech, innovation, and entrepreneurship, and, and of, of course, across uh, different sectors. Um, and, you know, the time went by so very fast, and sadly, we must conclude our inaugural Young Innovators panel as part of the Indigenous Innovation Spotlight Series, um, but I really want to express my heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you, uh, to our co-host Silar uh, and, and Claudette McGowan for um, sharing your really inspiring words, to Elder Shelley um, for, for, you know, opening our circle in such a gracious, generous, and, and lovely way, and, and Elder Shelley will be closing us out very soon to Samantha uh, Estuesta from, from TD Equity and Innovation for, um, you know, for really believing in us and, and this event, this series, and, and you know, staying the path with us. Um, and, uh, and to my team at, at CIT, again, you know, just um, so much gratitude uh, for all of your, your wisdom and, and leadership and, and support on this event. Um, so on behalf of, of uh, our team at CIT, um, our co-founder, Jarrett Lehman, um, and again, our, our fantastic sponsor, TD Equity and Innovation Program, partner, uh, CLAR, uh, we also wish to express, you know, um, to all of you across the country and beyond who are tuning in um, to this memorable session, you know, uh, an immense thank you. Uh, we're really grateful for your interest and enthusiasm. Uh, we would love to hear from you if you're interested in learning more about supporting and connecting with our tech skills advancement, uh, research, and 
entrepreneurship initiatives um, and or about registering for our upcoming programs. Please check out our website at uh, www.cit.io uh, for more information. And I now would like to invite Elder Shelley to do a traditional closing uh, to our circle and event today. Uh, miigwech, thank you. Um, all the best to all of you. Thank you. We sent up those uh, first words in the language uh, when we started on this journey together uh, in this circle and we uh, lifted up and acknowledged the four directions. So we've come full circle from the four directions and brought all those good thoughts and teachings uh, together. And in the doing of that, we have also honored uh, indigenous knowledge, uh, indigenous knowledge and elders. And what a what a great um, what a great time it's been. What a great day it's been. And we have heard uh, so many um, wonderful. Uh, heartfelt thoughts, experiences, but also um, challenges and ideas for the future. And that is um, also um, a reflection of the um, teaching of the circle and what we can learn uh, from each other when we work uh, in this way from an Indigenous, indigenous perspective um, as well. So I'd like to say um, which is a great big miigwech and for all of the um, teachings and also to continue to be kind and to to be open uh, to learning uh, new things Thank you.